So today we are not going to cover about test-driven development, unfortunately, but I would like to discuss a lot more about the Elastic Leadership book. And maybe when we have time, we will discuss about pipeline-driven organization. So when I read your book, as I mentioned in the beginning, it was really insightful, especially if you're working in a, maybe non-performing teams or in a startup where everything is like chaos. Tell us more why you started writing this book in the first place. What kind of problems do you see maybe in the technical world or maybe engineers for them to read this book? The book Elastic Leadership is based on a blog post, on a blog that I started writing. When I started becoming a team lead, as I was growing as a team lead, I would document my own realizations about things. And then slowly over time, a few years, it grew and grew. And I decided I'm going to turn it into a book. I wasn't sure what the book name would be. And I asked Kevlin Henney, who's a good friend of mine and a speaker and author. I was thinking about calling the book 97 Things Every Team Leader Should Know. But eventually I called it Elastic Leadership because I wanted to come up with a term that describes this kind of framework that I'm coming up with. So Elastic Leadership is based on all the mistakes that I've ever made as a team lead. I believe that the best way to learn something is through making mistakes. So I can tell you, I've learned quite a lot. I think that people should realize everybody in this industry doesn't really know what they're doing. They might have more experience. Doesn't mean that they know what they are doing. They might have had some success, some failure. There are some things that they know have worked or have not, but does not mean that they know what to do next. And so as a journey, as a team lead, there's been a lot of that stuff, trying to come up with different ideas. I'll give you the simple example. In my first team, I was very much a command and control leader. So I believed in protecting my team and having that bubble where people are not allowed to contact the team. And I believed I was doing the absolute right thing because the team was kind of in a chaotic state and all that stuff. And I believe that if you're not going to control what the team is, who the team talks to, then everyone will control the team instead of you. And that seemed to have worked for a while. And then I spoke about it at a conference. And I spoke about how you should be able to quickly take charge of a team and stuff like that. And at the end of the talk, this scrum master, I think, approached me at the end. He said, this is the opposite of everything I ever teach people, which is self-organizing teams and they should learn to make mistakes on their own and all that stuff. Well, don't you believe in that stuff? And I said, well, actually I do. I think that's really good ideas. And he said, well, how can you believe that and also believe in what you just thought, which is you have to take control and be a bit more command and control. And I really thought about it. I didn't have a really good answer. I thought about it. how can those two situations exist in the same time in the world? That was a big realization for me is that they don't. The same team can have different contexts. In one context, the team might be in what we would call survival mode, in which they don't have time to learn. They're too busy fighting fires. They don't have time to make mistakes. In that situation, command control might be a really good idea to get out of there. But if your team has time and they are learning and they want to learn, they want to practice, God forbid that you should be a command and control leader because they're not going to learn anything. So that's why I call it elastic leadership is because there are actually three different types of leadership styles. We change them based on where the team is at. So one week, the team might be in survival mode. The next week, the team might be in learning mode. And the week after, the team might be in self-organizing mode. And then they might go back to survival mode. We measure that by how much the team is able to cope with their current scenarios, with the current contexts. For example, if I have a team of developers that have been building websites, 100 websites the past year, and I'm asking them to build the next one, just another website, it's very likely that they're going to be much more of a self-organizing team. They know what to do. They know how to solve these issues. They just need a goal, really. But if I ask that same team to connect my glass of water to my laptop, and they don't have the skills to do it. And I immediately said, okay, we have a deadline and we need this by that, or at least we need something. The team would immediately be in what we call survival mode because they're probably overcommitted. They don't even know how long things take. They don't have time to learn and they might not even be able to discuss with me how to change the situation. In that situation, a command and control leadership might work. But in the other situation, a self-organizing team it's really best to leave the team mostly alone, not tell them how to do their job, but just tell them what you need done. They'll figure it out. And in the middle between those two extremes, there is the learning mode. That's the team that has time to learn, is actively engaging in learning. Well, the example that I use is imagine that you have a kid and you're teaching your kid how to tie their shoes for the first time. How long and how many times would they need to practice before they tie their shoes as fast as you? 
the answer is not going to be five minutes, probably not even five days. It's going to be a long while, a few good weeks, maybe even months, where slowly practice, and it's very frustrating. This is what learning really feels like. But in many situations, we go to a company and we say, okay, those people don't know how to do work in TDD, so let's just give them an extra 20% of time. But truly, what we should be looking at is five or 10 times more time to actually do and make mistakes and learn things the hard way, or at least a month or two. So learning mode is actually very difficult to be in because learning mode requires that you re-estimate some of the stuff that you're working on so that you can redo it, but this time with learning built in. So with the mistakes. But if you're in survival mode, you have to realize you're in survival mode. And then the only way to get out of survival mode is to make time to learn. The only way to make time to learn is you have to look at the current commitments and then remove whatever you can and finish whatever you cannot move. And within a month, you move into learning mode and re-estimate things. So this type of framework, these are things that I wish I knew or someone ever told me as a team lead. Because I didn't even think about those things. Those are the things that nobody really talks about. It's the glue between people. It is not Scrum. It is not Agile. It is not all those things. These are specifically methods for handling reality. And so a way to grow self-organizing teams. That's the way I think about it. So it's very interesting when I also read about these three phases of the team, right? Because as you mentioned, a team has a different context. And one day they could be in survival mode. The next day they could be in learning mode. The next day could be self-organizing, but then they can change to another mode. And as a team lead, sometimes we are not trained to understand about this context. And in the first place, you mentioned that you wish you know all of these things, right? Because many times as a team lead, especially the new ones who just got promoted from being a good IC, they just got promoted as a team lead. They don't understand these kind of nuances. In your book, you actually have this really interesting manifesto, a team leader manifesto. Can you tell us more about this manifesto? And what should be the responsibility of a team lead from your view? So the manifesto is basically, it's a compass. My realization for myself is that as a team lead, I have no idea if I'm doing the right thing. I need a moral compass, something that when I'm dealing with a dilemma, it allows me to decide which choice to make. If someone comes to me and says that they want me to help them with a problem, should I let them solve the problem alone? Should I solve it for them? Should I do something else instead? So the elastic leadership model is a moral compass and the manifesto is basically a way to explain it. The idea of the manifesto is to say, here is one worldview. And that worldview is that as a team leader, my job or the way I measure myself is that I make myself unneeded. So every day or every week I look and I try to even measure how much do people need me to solve their problems or can they start solving their problems without me? If they can solve more problems without me this week than they did last week, then I'm doing a better job. So that's one way to measure is that slowly over time, you are needed less and less, which is completely crazy because a lot of people want to be needed. But I mean, that's kind of your job. Won't you get fired if you're not needed? And the answer is you will actually become more successful and more valuable to your company if you are no longer a bottleneck for the people that are working with you and under you. Which means that every time you are the only person that is able to make a decision or that needs to be consulted with or that has the experience to give an opinion on what to do something and people will not move forward without you, you are essentially a bottleneck. Another way to say it is that you are a bus factor. A lot of people have already heard this, but let me just define it. A bus factor is the number of people that have to get hit by a bus for the team to stop working. Now, bus factor of one means you have this person in the team that if that person doesn't come into work tomorrow, the team is screwed. They don't know how to do that specific person's job. So a person that knows how the build works or the manager or the leader that is able to sign or make a specific decision or an architect that has to sign off on something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as a team lead, I want to remove myself as a bottleneck over time more and more. We also believe a few different qualities. We believe that it's just as important to understand how people work instead of just machines. So we need to understand how people work. We need to understand psychology a little bit because part of our job is working with people. I think that's more important because computers do exactly what you tell them. In fact, if you could get rid of people in the software business, everything would be much easier. We can't, unfortunately. So you have to understand people better. Another thing is that we adopt a leadership style that keeps changing instead of a one style, one size fits all. 
which means that we look at the current phases of the team and we see where the team is and we change our leadership style based on it. And lastly is we believe that people need to grow under our care, which means that one way to remove yourself as a bottleneck is to grow the people that are working with you. So they learn new things. So they learn how to think like you think. They don't need you. And that's a very powerful feeling. So growing people and challenging them to get out of their comfort zone would be one of those things. That's a very difficult thing for a lot of leaders to do because sometimes people don't like getting out of their comfort zone. But if you're trying to get your team into learning mode, the whole point of learning mode is that you feel uncomfortable. The whole point is that you're trying to learn things that you've never done before, which feels really, really sometimes frustrating or annoying. So all these things together, they form this moral compass every day. Am I a bottleneck more or less? Am I challenging people? Do I pay attention to human interactions and understanding how they happen? Am I changing my leadership style? All those things together. That's the manifesto, really.